Hi, hello, and welcome to The Word. We are walking through the life of Jesus from his birth to his death, and we are doing so through the accounts of the New Testament Gospel writers, the only accounts that we have available to us. We have seen his birth, his baptism, his fast, and now he calls his disciples. We will also touch on what it means to be a disciple today. The internet and book stores are filled with someone leaving one denomination and joining the next. For example, why I left the Jehovah Witness and joined the SDA, why I left the Catholic Church and joined the Pentecostal Church, why I left Islam and joined the Christian Church, why I left Christianity and joined Islam. It's interesting that one person gets enlightened and leaves one denomination while someone from the same denomination gets enlightened and joins the same one that the other has left. Is there a solution to this? Ready for the journey? Let's get started. Let me point something out to you. How do you feel when someone preaches the gospel, but it's not of your faith? Well, you become eager to tell them that they need to know more of the truth. How many of you do not pray when someone outside of your denomination is praying? Why does this happen? Because you are thinking God is only going to answer the prayers of those who are his remnant, who believe in these set of doctrines. Outside of that, everyone is lost. Do you know that this is not yours to do? That the gift of salvation belongs only to Jesus? That is what Jesus came to do. His message was to the world or to everyone. Let us see what happens as we learn about the call of the disciples. But before we do so, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come again in your presence asking that you guide us today. Speak to our hearts as we are all convinced that we are called to vehemently defend the truth. The truth is Jesus and in Jesus. Are we really talking about Jesus or are we boiled up by doctrines? Does Jesus bring us no excitement? But one notion against tithing sets our hearts on a war path to condemn and excommunicate. Teach us to love you and have a relationship with you. And may we continue to study your word, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us take a look at the account of Jesus calling disciples. Remember, we have established that these stories were not written by those who were actually there. Well, there is this argument whether Matthew was there. My simple argument is that they spoke in the third person, but never spoke as though they were present. And even if it were the same Matthew, the disciple, he was not an eyewitness to the birth and life of Jesus, including his baptism, etc. Somebody would have had to tell him. Like Paul said, Jesus called me and gave me the gospel. Matthew does not say that. He said he called Matthew in the third person. Anyways, these debates are pointless for me because they do not change the fact that Jesus existed and he saves. So let us start with Matthew. He tells us that right after Jesus overcame the temptations of the devil, angels attended to him. Then he branches off into the ministry of Jesus and where he went to live. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then left there and moved to Capernaum, besides the Sea of Galilee, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah, verse 15, in the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, beside the sea, beyond the Jordan River, in Galilee, where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, 
he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets, and he called them to come to. They immediately followed him, leaving their boat and their father behind. Now take note, these men left their livelihood and followed Jesus. So Mark also talks of this event after the fast. Verse 14, later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Now the language of one day tells you that it was not just immediately. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat, repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. So let us enumerate the disciples that were called so far. We have Simon and Andrew, then James and John, sons of Zebedee. That's all we were given here. So let us go further to Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 13. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Praised by everyone. Bear that in mind. So as I told you, he did not call the disciples right away. He returned and was preaching the kingdom of God. As you read, his fame was far and wide. It was something new and different. Many have tried, but this man continued his story that he is the Messiah. So Peter and the others would have heard of him. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. Now we do not use this to say that since Jesus kept the Sabbath, then we must. Jesus kept the Passover also, should we? He was under the old covenant, so he had to keep the Sabbath and the sacrifice lambs. But don't get ideas as I just said that. Verse 17, the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Ordinary people did not have scrolls. He was not trained in the schools of the scribes and Pharisees. How did he know where to find this passage? Just saying. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. He's saying that while he sat. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be? They ask. Isn't this Joseph's son? So everyone is impressed with what they heard. He became famous and, and you can say loved by people. But there was one thing that did not fit. He was homeboy. We know him. What could be so special about him? Then things changed. All that time, he had no disciples. Verse 23, then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself. Meaning, 
Do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly, there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha. But the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious, jumping up. They mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. So the attitude of wanting to kill people because they said something that was not according to what you believe is not new. So all who know that what they preach is not according to some beliefs, prepare for the backlash. Then Jesus went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and taught there in the synagogue every Sabbath day. There, too, the people were amazed at his teaching, for he spoke with authority. Once when he was in the synagogue, a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, cried out, shouting, Go away! Go away! Why are you interfering with us? Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the demon threw the man to the floor. As the crowd watched, then it came out of him without hurting him further. Amazed, the people exclaimed, What authority and power this man's words possess! Even evil spirits obey him and they flee at his command. The news about Jesus spread through every village in the entire region. After leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home, where he found Simon's mother-in-law, very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. Standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. As the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. Have mercy. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Some men tried to replicate that. Many were possessed by demons, and the demons came out at his command, shouting, You are the Son of God! But because they knew he was the Messiah, he rebuked them, and refused to let them speak. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowds searched everywhere for him, and when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. Amen. So he continued to travel around, preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. So here we have it, Jesus doing miracles when he returned to Galilee. But in Nazareth, they condemned him. Jesus continued preaching the gospel, and in chapter 5, he met Simon, Peter, and James. Luke chapter 5. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge for the fishermen had left them and were washing the nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now, go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time the nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, 
he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Now that explains a bit more how he called Peter and James and the other fishermen, sons of Zebedee. They were awestruck by what just happened. If we didn't have this detail, we would think he just passed by and said, Hey guys, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But listen to this most incredible account. When they had caught all these fish, they left all that they had and followed Jesus. And somebody jumps up and said, oh, that is why we need to leave our jobs to work for Jesus. Or don't pursue anything in this life to work for Jesus. <laughs> Nonsense. We are not to put meaning to scriptures when it does not give us permission to do so. So if everybody is working for Jesus, who's going to bring in the offerings? Who's going to bring in their, their love gifts? Now let us see how different John's account will be. Still in John chapter 1, we are reading from verse 32. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one. But when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testified that he is the chosen one of God. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, this is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. Now, so as we said before, those who gave Luke this account said he started to call disciples the next day after his baptism. It's possible that the ones who gave him that report had no clue of the 40 days fast. But as we said, details after decades of an incident will have different versions. But it does not change that the thing has happened. Now in the other Gospels, Jesus called Peter and his brother when he went to Galilee. But here we are told that he met them the next day and that they were John's disciples. Um, Jesus would still be in Jerusalem. Then after calling the two, he went to his hometown. Verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. See that? He found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth? exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself. Philip replied, as they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathanael asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Verse 49, then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. 
you will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Now this branches us off into what are disciples or those called by God. Is there a distinction between disciples and other persons called by God? Everyone who is called to follow Jesus is a disciple. So what about apostles? Well, I will deal with that some other time. But we are called to be disciples. Later, the followers of Jesus were called Christians because everyone could now link them with Christ. And this is what it must be. Jesus went out preaching the gospel and he said it's about the kingdom of God. This is where I want to focus. The kingdom of God is not a denomination. Please, please, please take note of that. The kingdom of God is not a denomination. Denominations are defined as such. Take a listen. A Christian denomination is a distinct religious body within Christianity that comprises all church congregations of the same kind, identifiable by traits such as a name, a peculiar history, organization, leadership, theological doctrine, worship style, and sometimes a founder. It is a secular and neutral term generally used to denote any established Christian church. Unlike a cult or sect, a denomination is usually seen as part of the Christian religious mainstream. Most Christian denominations self-describe as churches, whereas some newer ones tend to use the terms churches, assemblies, fellowships, etc. interchangeably. Divisions between one group and another are defined by authority and the doctrine. Issues such as the nature of Jesus, the authority of apostolic succession, biblical hermeneutics, theology, ecclesiology, eschatology, and papal primacy may separate one denomination from another. Groups of denominations often sharing broadly similar beliefs, practices, and historical ties are sometimes known as branches of Christianity. These branches differ in many ways, especially through differences in practices and beliefs. It goes on further to say the Catholic Church, which has over 1.3 billion members of 50.1%, of all Christians worldwide, does not view itself as a denomination, but as the original pre-denominational church, a view rejected by other Christians. Protestant denominations altogether have an estimated 800 million to 1 billion adherents, which account for approximately 37 to 40 percent of all Christians worldwide. Together, Roman Catholicism and Protestantism with major traditions including Adventism, Anabaptism, Anglicanism, Baptist, Calvinism, Lutheranism, Methodism, Moravianism, and Pentecostalism compose Western Christianity. Western Christian denominations prevail in Western, Northern, Central, and South Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Americas, and Oceania. The Catholic Church is indeed the pre-denominational church. That's correct. So how do you solve this dilemma? I don't think you ever will because denominations have followers who are dedicated. Denominations are multi-million dollar establishments that took years to build. So here is the truth. No amount of ideas about coming out of the Catholic, Pentecostal, or Jehovah Witness or Adventist churches will stop these churches from continuing. So what is your objective then? And what are we supposed to do? People have to assemble. People have to be spiritually nurtured. People have to belong to a group of believers. The ideal thing is if we can get everyone to stop and examine and re-examine their beliefs and see if they are really founded on the word of God only. You're yeah, right. They will kill you instead. But how many times do we say that the truth should not be afraid of doctrinal scrutiny? Truth is not afraid of debate, yet people tell others, don't watch Pastor Joseph's study or don't watch Pastor Francois' study. Some reports come to me that people who don't watch say that they are wrong or the studies are wrong. How do you know if something is wrong if you didn't watch? It is simple. The fear of being wrong. 
the fear of having to see that what you believe for all these years were incorrect. People will send hate speeches, ostracize you, even if you have not left a denomination, but question certain doctrines. You see, none of us were there when these early men formulated doctrines, but we connected them as though we formulated them and will not accept anyone showing us otherwise. I was in a discussion the other day and I was told that God permitted and never condemned more than one wife. I have promised to take a second look at the subject again. But all I know from scripture is that God from the beginning ordained one man to one woman. He said it in Genesis and I believe Jesus reiterated it. But I was told that was before sin. So when people hear things like this, they are ready to pull out their swords and ready to shoot with their guns. Just relax and give yourself an opportunity to learn. Then when you are finished, you can say why you disagree. But your disagreement must only come with scripture that is correct, correct scripture, not your own interpretation. And that is why I'm teaching you how to allow the scripture to speak to you by using the original language. Every Bible you read is a translation, including the King James Version. So no Bible is holier than the other. Translators can twist the text based of their beliefs or based on their biases, but going back to the original can help. It may be slow, but I believe in time it will get through. It's not about views, but about people getting the message. But our human nature always wants to see that we, what we say is conceded. But more and more God is teaching me not to look at the number of views, nor whether people respond favorably or not, but teach the gospel. When Elijah thought he was the only one, there were thousands of others and other prophets that had not bowed to Baal. So the irony about finding out that the doctrines you believe is wrong or the doctrines you believed are wrong um, propels you to want to tell others not to go into that direction this is false but at the same time you do not want your focus of Jesus to change to challenge in a church so I have taken the road of preaching Jesus if while doing so we come across something that is against scripture I will point it out and if your church teaches that then so be it if you choose to reject it before studying hey suit yourself if you choose to look into it because you value your salvation and your spiritual walk and knowledge, then to God be the glory. Just remember, people will always be born in denominations, and when they come in through baptism, they normally have little knowledge of all the details of the denomination. They accept Jesus from what they have heard. Later, they might know some things that may surprise them. So we are still asking the question, what is the solution? Jesus. I am not calling you out of your church to go anywhere. I am calling you to Jesus. When you realize that your church is not aligning itself with the Bible and the Bible only, you will move mentally than physically. So it's not about me or us thinking about ourselves, but it's about the kingdom of God. Let us take a listen at some excerpts of individuals who have left their churches. I don't have the rights to any of these videos, but they are in the public domain, so I have the right to use them. But if you wish to view all, I can put the link below in the description, or you can search them for yourself by the subject. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Wes McAdams from Baker Heights Church of Christ. On Crosstalk, we don't shy away from difficult conversations. We want to handle them with kindness and with love, but we also want to reveal truth and even expose error. On today's show, we will talk with a man who left the Catholic Church. We'll find out why he left the Catholic Church and what he has to say about some of the doctrines and practices there. We'll be right back with today's special guest. Well, if you don't mind, share some of those questions that you had that you weren't finding the answers for sure. in the places that you were looking. What were some of the issues that you, you struggled with and dealt with and tried to find an answer to as you were looking? Well, you know, the Bible wasn't held as in highest esteem in my household that it probably should have been. Um, you know, I realize that there are, there are some Catholics that are very devoted to the Word of God. We weren't necessarily. And so when I, once I started studying for myself and started uh, looking at the Word of God, I realized, you know, that the church that you're reading about, 
the New Testament church that you're reading about, specifically in Acts, but in other places that Paul talks about the church, I was realizing, you know, that this description didn't match what I was currently involved in. And so then I started looking at structure. You know, we had a pope who, you know, was really, you know, the head of the church and, and the extension of God, more or less, here on earth. And I, I didn't find, um, you know, justification for a pope. I realized that, you know, we were taught that Peter was the first pope, but, but you look at it, you know, uh, there are a lot of things that didn't match up there. You know, uh, as far as I could tell <clears throat> in the New Testament, we never see that Peter was even in Rome. Um, you know, he was a married man, um, you know, was not celibate. Um, you know, there were just a lot of things that, that didn't add up, plus the fact that, you know, Jesus was the head of the church. You know, New Testament, you know, reiterates that over and over again, that he, he died for the church, that he purchased it member by member with his own blood. And so, you know, he, he is to be the head of it. And then you look at the structure with elders and with, with, uh, with deacons and things of that nature, that didn't add up. And then, you know, the, the perpetual virginity of Mary and, you know, how we exalt her. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't see that in the Bible. There was no justification scripturally for that in the Bible. And so I, I started questioning even more, you know, the, these things and some other things saying, you know, this, this just isn't adding up. And if God left this word, if he revealed himself through the word of God, then we've got to take this seriously, don't we? And we've got to look at this for what it is and accept it for what it is as the authority that he has left us with. And that, that caused some real questions and some real consternation in my life as I wrestled with that. Right. Well, he said a lot, and I know many will agree with him. His main point is that what he saw from the church did not line up with the Bible, so he could not remain. Welcome back. We're talking with Chris McCurley about why Chris left the Catholic Church. Chris, in the last segment, we talked a lot about some of the reasons that they got you thinking about different things, questioning what you had been taught and what you'd been what you'd heard. We talked about some of the positives that you learned there. Um, but but eventually, you found yourself. You said at the Seventh and Moeller Congregation, mm -hmm. uh, you found yourself in the Churches of Christ. Now, some people would listen to this discussion and they would say, Well, Chris. You just swapped one denomination for another. What difference does it make? And, and so what brought you to the Church of Christ? And, you know, what does that mean? And, and, and what, what brought you to where you finally were there? The key for me was to continue to study and not to take anybody's word for it, but to, to continue to search for myself. And, and what, what you discover when you're looking through and, and looking at the New Testament church, specifically in the book of Acts, but also, you know, in the other New Testament writings, is that, you know, even that term denomination was not, was not ever a part of, of what uh, the, the church was to be about. Right. Jesus didn't say to Peter, you know, uh, upon this rock, I'm gonna build my denomination or I'm gonna build my churches. I'm gonna build a church that you can choose which one you wanna go to. Denomination literally means to name and divide. And yet throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus, we see Paul praying earnestly for unity. You know, that they all be unified, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, all of those things, we see unity at the heart, at the crux of the matter when it came to the church. And so, uh, this is not, uh, and I, I hope our viewers understand, this is, this is not Church of Christ versus another denomination, right. okay? This is, what does it mean to be a New Testament Christian as a part of the New Testament church? That's what it's all about. How do I define a Christian? And then how do I define the church that Jesus Christ set up, the one that we read about in the book of Acts and at other places in the New Testament? You know, how, that's who I wanna be and that's what I wanna be a part of. Uh, because I, I believe if you're striving to be that, then you're always going to be right with God. Don't miss what he is saying here. His church is not a denominational church, but believers in Christ. Well, if you don't know, you can't be considered a church if you are not registered. And there are two ways to register, as a charity or a corporation. As charity, you will not be taxed. As a corporation, you are like any other business. Let's take another. This program contains content that may disturb some viewers. So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. Eight million Jehovah's Witnesses around the globe believe the end is nigh for a world that is controlled by Satan, and only they will be saved. Rules are set by a US-based governing body of eight men who sit at the pinnacle of the Jehovah's Witness organization, 
called the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. All witnesses are expected to obey their instructions and doctrines that influence every aspect of life. Jehovah's Witnesses believe these men are anointed as the voice of God on earth. There is no other means by which Jehovah God, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, communicates with the world. So it is through that uh, conduit of the governing body that Jehovah speaks. So whatever they say is to be accepted as the word of God and not to be confused with the speaking of an opinion of men. They are absolute leaders with absolute power over the organization. The governing body live at a complex they call Bethel, or the House of God, in New York State. This world headquarters is a 100-acre site that replaced a sprawling Brooklyn campus, sold off in recent years for over a billion dollars. The governing body oversees a vast global real estate portfolio. They're a big multi-billion dollar asset business. Multi-billion dollar properties. They sold their assets in New York and moved to uh, New York State and built a new, uh, their new headquarters there and they're building other big buildings. The Australian branch owns at least 440 properties and last year reported an income of over $32 million. As a religious charity, it receives significant tax exemptions. A charity doesn't have to pay income tax on its earnings. It may also have deductible gift recipient status, which is where the donor gets the tax write-off. There may be other taxes, including state taxes which are forgiven for charities. I think it's really ironic that an organization that has predicted that the end of the world is imminent and predicted the end four times, the last time in 1975, would create a long-term investment portfolio with real estate that they carefully maintained and, and made a great deal of money. Because we were taught that only Jehovah's people in the organisation would survive Armageddon. Everyone else on the outside would die. So that was, it was our job to go out witnessing to try and bring those, as many people in as we could. And if you didn't take the opportunity to witness, you had their blood on your hand. They are raised in this kind of fear bubble in which they're constantly being told the end of the world is near, Jehovah God is going to murder people who are unbelievers, you are going to be judged. And there's this pressure to save people, to go and go door to door, to proselytize. And at the same time, no birthdays, no holidays. It's, it's, it's really kind of abysmal. Independent thought and analysis is discouraged, as is higher education. Higher education often instills a sense of superiority and self-reliance that is in direct opposition to the Christian personality. We will not need doctors or lawyers after Armageddon, but we will need carpenters and plumbers and similar construction trades. The moral rules of the Jehovah's Witnesses are strictly enforced by all-male panels called judicial committees. They're set out in a manual called Shepherd the Flock of God. So you could almost say it's the elders' Bible. They abide by everything that's written in there. Even if some things might be questionable, the elders still have to uphold what's in that, in that guidebook. The people who break away from the Jehovah's Witnesses pay a terrible price. They remain cut off from their families and closest friends, those they love the most. Within the ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, we do it once a year, is a memorial day. I did it a few times. You, you take a bunch of flowers and a card to mourn the loss of your family and leave it on the door of a Kingdom Hall. It's like a death. And that's where I've come to terms with Mum died three weeks ago and I just got a t I knew it was coming at some point and I just got a text message from my brother say, oh, by the way, uh, Mum died yesterday uh, of stomach cancer, doesn't want a funeral, didn't want to fuss, and that's it, Jeff. 
built this. I've just had to grieve the fact that, look, until they wake up themselves and leave and come out of the religion, that basically I just have to view them as that they've passed away, uh, which is not nice, but it's a way of coping. Just imagine that once you leave this denomination, you have to mourn the death of your family because they will not accept you. What kind of Christianity is that? So without knowing, people get caught up, then out of fear, they can't leave. This has to be cultish. And there is a policy that even if a child is molested, once there were not two witnesses, then the perpetrator cannot be dealt with. So elders molest hundreds of children and are left to preach to the same children in the congregation. You know the kind of trauma that is? Tonight, a rare and revealing look inside a religion that might well have come knocking on your front door. Over the next hour, we'll take you inside the Jehovah's Witnesses from three people who have left. I'm not free. I have to hide today. It's just torture. It's just torture. Do you think you'll ever be free from this? I don't know. I'm trying. The overall tenet is that they are the one specific chosen religion and after a designated period of time, uh, Jehovah will destroy all of wicked mankind and then only faithful witnesses will be allowed to either live through that tribulation or to be resurrected from the dead into that new world. Blood transfusions are banned. So too is military service, saluting a flag or singing a national anthem. Active members are required to do this, spread the word of the Jehovah's Witness in public places and file monthly field reports. That's why they don't encourage college education and full-time jobs so that you can go distribute their material. Did you do that as well? I hated it. I always hoped that nobody would answer. I hated pushing people. It was something you had to do. Judicial committees decide the punishment, anything from a public rebuke to being kicked out of the religion. And yet Alice says those same committees have a rule that puts children at risk. The two witness rule cannot be changed. So if a child gets abused and there isn't a witness, then that means that they leave it in God's hands. For them, it's a sin. It's not a crime. So you have heard the experiences of just three people who have left the religion. Uh, we did want to talk to those who still belong for balance to this story. The organization's media spokesman declined, though, uh, saying that such stories are often designed to be adversarial. We respect each person's freedom of choice and belief and do not wish to engage in needless debates. This one coming up is interesting. Well, this one is long, so you will have to watch it on your own. We will just give the pertinent parts. Good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program, and each week I have this privilege of introducing to you men and women who, because of their love for Christ, were committed to following what was true, and in the process they were drawn home to the Catholic Church in a way that they didn't suspect. And I, I think that's very much true for this evening's guest. Uh, in fact, she comes from a, a, a non-Catholic background that is, to a certain extent, rare for uh, our, our guests. Uh, Teresa Beam is a former Seventh-day Adventist, and uh, so she'll be here to tell her story in just a moment. But Teresa, welcome to the Journey Home program. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank you. Like I mentioned to the audience, we don't have seven, former Seventh-day Adventists on the program all that often. And I think it's important as we talk about that, even as I'm, uh, we posed it to the audience here, about their experience of Seventh-day Adventists, a lot of people mix that group up with other groups right. that actually originate at the same time but have a completely different right. idea of theology. So right. as we do every week in the program, I invite the guests to start way back at the beginning and give us a little snippet of your spiritual journey. It isn't so much pointing out the Pope as the Antichrist and all those other things, but really feeling that Catholics were out to get you. Absolutely. They have a, a prophetess named Ellen White. And Ellen White had a uh, vision, supposedly had a vision that was three when hours long. When did she live approximately? She lived, she was uh, early 19th century. Okay. And um, she ha had been a part of the Millerite movement. I, a lot of people 
may not know that, but anyway, it's in my book. <laughs> okay. But uh, yep. but uh, she was. Um, uh, they had sp kind of spun off the Seventh Day Adventist Church spun off the Mill the Millerite movement, and she had this dream, or it was a vision, that uh, in the end times that there's going to be a demarcation between true Christians and false Christians, and that the the demarcation is. Sabbatarianism. In other words, if you are going to church on Sunday, they believe that in the end times, which to an Adventist is always imminent, because that's part of what they, mm. there is always an imminent about to come, the Lord's about to come. And um, so they taught that when, in these end times, um, the Sabbath is going to be the issue. And if you're, if you're going to church on Sunday and you don't repent of that and become a Sabbatarian, you're going to end up having the mark of the beast. And then the Catholics are going to spearhead a worldwide ecumenical group that's going to come after Seventh-day Adventists, and they're going to torture them, hunt them down, torture them, and even kill them. And that's why we were taught from just a child up, we are someday going to have to be martyred for being Sabbatarians. But it's all based on the Seventh Day yep. as the key doctrine. So do Seventh-day Adventists that's one of the Ten Commandments. So That's right. do they hold to the other ten? Do they hold to the other laws of Moses? Well, uh, Seventh-day Adventists do believe that we're supposed to keep, uh, we're supposed to keep the Levitical laws of unclean, unclean and clean meats. So Seventh-day Adventists do not, as a doctrine, they do not eat shellfish or uh, pork. But Seventh-day Adventists are also known for their health message, which is you shouldn't even eat meat. And so mm -hmm. most Seventh-day Adventists do not eat meat. All right. And but there's a whole bunch of other oh, yeah. rules in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and I'm guessing that what they've done is picked and choosed here. Right. They emphasize seventh right. day, right. they emphasize tithing, and they emphasize the, these eating rules, right. but all the other things about the priesthood. Right. They, they don't. I, and, and I know it's... Be, you Did know. you see that when you were a Seventh-day Adventist, that there was this problem with that? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, and it all comes down to Ellen White, their prophetess, okay. because they, they, are, they claim to be very, very biblical based, which they, I mean, they study their right. Bible. I mean, you, uh, I've, I've met lots of Baptists that believe they're going to just really pin the Adventists down in, in a debate, but Seventh-day Adventists know their Bible. The difference is they see it through the lens of Ellen White. And they, they, it's just something you're indoctrinated to do. Mm -hmm. And so until you can, and I really believe the Lord takes that away from you. Uh, just a, it's a grace that he gives to c certain people so, you mm -hmm. know, that, that they can actually see the Bible for what it actually says. What she said here is correct. Seventh-day Adventists view the Bible through Ellen White. How could you have a Bible study guide every quarter and its pages are full of quotations from Ellen White? That is not the Bible. So after being indoctrinated this way, it is hard. Very, very hard. I mean, extremely hard, hard, extremely, extremely hard for SDAs to see anything outside of that. Once a Seventh-day Adventist, you are defaulted to Adventism and Ellen White. Very much uh, uh, seeing the, the scriptures, of course, not through Catholic tradition, but with a different tradition, the tradition that did it begin with Ellen White or began with the Millerites and then kind of augmented by Ellen right. G. White? Is right. Well, uh, the Millerites believed that the Lord was going to come October 22, 1844. They had hundred, almost anywhere between 50 to 100,000 people on the East Coast that gave up jobs, gave up farms, gave up uh, uh, homes to support Miller and, and all his evangelists to spread this word. And then when he didn't come, they had what was called a great disappointment. <laughs> I mean, and it, it is really, really a very sad uh, part of, chap yeah. uh, of history that we don't, yeah. we don't know as Americans. But anyway, uh, a group of those Millerites just could not give up the fact. Something happened. They believed on October 22, there was a man named Hiram, Ed Hiram Edson that, quote, had a vision that said that the Lord uh, didn't come to earth that day, but what he did do is he went from the holy place to the most holy place, and that he started the actual judgment of God's people at that time in 1844. And so 
Ellen White then had all these visions to support this mm -hmm. idea. And so every single thing is seen through the eyes of Ellen White. Okay. And so... Were the Millerites Seventh Day? No. Okay. No. Am I correct in saying that on the one hand that there are actually Seventh-day Adventists that recognize that many of the things that Ellen G. White says in her books are contradictory or non-scriptural, variety of issues or prophecies have come true, but that Seventh-day Adventists really can't talk about that. Well, I think that they don't believe that. I think that they really believe that they're going to come true. I, oh, I think that yeah. they reje completely reject the idea that, that everything she, didn't, she said wasn't true. And uh, they don't see the contradictions. Are there some that have seen and gotten in trouble for it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to you. But I'm, uh, I mean, in the sense of, you know, uh, Seventh Day Adventists studied scripture, studied history, studied th and recognized there's problems here. Well, okay. Seventh day Adventists have their own education system. And they put out, they have all these publishing houses, and they put out their own, uh, their own books. And so, in every single time they read anything about Christian history, it is slanted okay. to indoctrinate children into what they believe. And it is very, very difficult, especially when you're ruled by fear. Because when you're told that everyone out there is going to be deceived by the Antichrist, mm -hmm. you alone, you better cling with all your heart to these, these principles and these things you've been taught, or you're going to be deceived. On the point concerning anyone who points out the errors, whether they get in trouble, yes, this is true, but also true of every other strong-willed faith, like the Jehovah Witness, Mormonism, and Catholicism. So if a Catholic starts saying something that makes sense to them, do they immediately believe they're being deceived? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, yeah, they're, they're programmed to believe that you have been deceived, and they must get you uh, into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, because if they don't, then you are going to be one of those people that are going to turn around and um, hurt them <laughs> later. And so huh. this book not only tells the uh, history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the doctrines, and it's, it's very well sourced, but in the end of it explains how do you reach a Seventh-day Adventist. What, what do you do? How do you say? How do you act? Mm -hmm. Because the, the interesting thing is about Adventists, they're not like a lot of anti-Catholic haters. They're scared of them. They're a lot more scared of a Catholic than the Catholic would be of them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I would love to see some Catholics adopt some of the Adventists, at least in their prayer life, mm -hmm. to help them. Because think of the fear. I mean, I grew up with such fear, and most Adventists do, mm -hmm. of Catholics. And uh, I just think that's, it's, it's very sad. To a certain extent, are they, from your experience, you, you said their education system so encloses them to isolate themselves from other thinking. Are they even more so than some of the other sects like Mormonism or Jehovah Witness? I mean, is it I'm not, I don't know, okay. you know, but uh, they're pretty close. They have a lot of um, little towns that they kind of, just yeah. stay in their little towns like Loma Linda, California, and uh, Keene, Texas, and Hagerstown, Maryland. All right, yeah, and centers in Michigan, I know. Right. Those are the ones I was familiar right. with when I used to work in Michigan. Yeah, that's right. And, and Seventh-day Adventists are very conspiratorial. They are always seeing a conspiracy uh, beneath everything that happens in government. And because uh, Ellen White had, you know, projected all this was going to happen, it's very, very easy for Seventh-day Adventists to say, well, she's right. Look at the state of things today. You have to admit Ellen's prophecies were correct because she said things were going to, uh, we were going to have a great ecumenical movement and the Pope was going to say such and such, such and such. <laughs> and uh, indeed, I mean, you know, these things happen, but uh, I don't think that she, <laughs> you can say that she made this great prophecy. I think that these were self-fulfilling, actually. But very good. Okay, in your book, it's okay not to be a Seventh-day Adventist uh, that the audience, if they're interested, can find on Amazon.com. Really quick, got about a minute left. Let's say we got a Seventh-day Adventist watching tonight. Would you like to say a word to them why they ought to consider making the same journey that you and your husband made? Um, well, Seventh-day Adventists say they're biblical, and they say that m nothing is more important than truth. And so much of what you have been taught as a Seventh-day Adventist is not the truth. And 
I, not that you were lied to, because I, I believe that generation after generation just tells the same information, not realizing that it's not true. I would suggest you go back and read the early fathers, Ignatius, Clement, um, Irenaeus, yep. uh, Polycarp, and find out what the earliest Christians believed. And I think that it, that would be my just advice. Just might open their heart. Hello, YouTube. My name is Xander Connect, and I am an ex Seventh day Adventist. As closely as I have been able to, I have joined the Roman Catholic Church. Now I'm here to share this video with you. It's a brief summary of my faith journey. I'll apologize in advance for not being a great public speaker. And I'll also say to follow your conscience. If you're convinced that God has called you to be a Seventh-day Adventist, then be that with all your heart. I'm not telling you to violate your conscience. What I am telling you to do is to not be afraid. That is something that Jesus himself said countless times. And I'd like to just quote one Bible verse to you that, that sums it all up for me. And this verse is, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Those are things that God wants for you. God wants love in your life. He wants a sound mind. He wants mental health in your life. He does not want fear. And for many of you watching this video, if you have anything in common with my journey, you may have questions about the Seventh-day Adventist faith, but you may, at some fundamental level, just be afraid to leave it because of what you may have been taught. And I'm here to tell you, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And you know, if there's a, if you're in a church that fundamentally believes that they're the only remnant and that Roman Catholics are just the tool of the devil, and I've, I've heard it all, it's, you know, I'm not interested in being part of a church like that. If somebody actually believed that, and to, to, to their credit, most Seventh-day Adventists I've known do not believe it all the way. Most of them are, um, are still searching. But if you actually believe everything that the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches at its core, I do believe that you will become really an anti-Christian influence. You're going to be this person who's out there trying to steal sheep, persuade other people who are just trying to follow Jesus that they're doing it wrong and that your way is the best and the only way. And it becomes all about you. It becomes exactly what they criticize the Roman Catholic Church for being, this authority that tries to put itself in the place of God. Wow. Hear what this young man says. If you believe that it's only through your church that one can be saved, then you are like the Catholic Church who you condemn. Let us dissect the excerpts you just saw. And we will conclude. Catholics leaving to join the Church of Christ with no denominational name. Jehovah's Witnesses leaving but out of fear and being shunned. Witnesses teaching that they are the only ones to be saved. As well as Adventists with the Sabbath. Witnesses having men who are the voice of God. Ellen White being the prophet of the SDA and SDA is leaving to go to the Catholic Church. Now whose testimony is the right one? Which one is going to save them? Everyone finds the error in the other and goes to the one that another has just left. After watching this, whoever you are, you can do a few things. Dismiss this like it's of no value, or you can take a second look at what you believe and confront your leaders for answers. Confront them for biblical answers. Start discussing and share. So what are we supposed to do if everyone is wrong, Pastor? That is a good question. I'm referencing to what the gentleman from Crosstalk said. It's about studying the Word of God without aid of any outside spiritual source and obeying what it says. Jesus does not call denominations. I'm saying that over and over again. He calls disciples. Jesus' disciples were those who obeyed his teachings. The Christian's teaching of the gospel comes from the New Testament. Being disciples is not a movement coming out of the Catholic Church or a movement coming out of the SDA Church or a movement coming out of the Jehovah Witnesses Church or a movement coming out of the Mormons or any other established denomination. It's about Jesus. There are doctrines and beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that are not biblical. There are doctrines and beliefs of the Jehovah's Witnesses that are not biblical. There are doctrines and beliefs of the Catholic Church that are not biblical, of the Methodists, Anglican, Evangelicals, Pentecostals, that are not biblical. 
even if they use the Bible to defend. It's just their opinion twisting scripture. So what do you do? What are we going to do? Well, if Jesus could not change the Jewish believers around him, do you think you or I can change established um, denominations? When Jesus called out the disciples, they became part of his church. When Paul came on the scene, people had already begun worshiping in houses and in synagogues and in churches. But the message given is of the fellowship of believers and not of denominations. So now is the time to begin to re-examine what you were taught. Go to my videos. There are others like Pastor Courtney Francois. Go to them. Don't be afraid and examine them. If what is presented is truth beyond the shadow of a doubt, accept it. If it is not, reject it. But make sure that you understand in whom your salvation is. If it is in Jesus and you understand that and you wholeheartedly accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, many things will be of little importance. What I think everyone is concerned about is being under the yoke or yokes that are not necessary for your salvation. We cannot determine who is going to be saved. We can only accept Jesus and share Jesus. So if I leave the SDA church, where do I go? If I leave the Jehovah's Witness Church, where do I go? People have to fellowship, as I said, and worship. I can't just leave and stay home. Where two or three are gathered together, God is in the midst to bless. So do we go back to house meetings, Pastor? The internet cannot replace physical worship. I do not have the answer for all these mega questions. My best response is, I give you Jesus and the kingdom of God. It is not affiliated to any denomination and any person. It is opened to all of us. It becomes difficult for those who follow the Bible and the Bible only to continue fellowship in churches that do not uphold all of the truths of the Bible. But which one does? When you ask questions and you get threatened, then it's time to start thinking very hard. It's time to start analyzing. If you are told if you don't believe in the writings of Ellen White or you do not return tithes, you will be stripped off your offices, then it's time to think very hard. Ellen White is not scripture, nor is she Jesus Christ. If the church tells you that you must pray to Mary with the rosary, it's time to think hard because only Jesus we pray to. If the church tells you that Jesus is a created angel and not God, according to John, it's time to think because it is established that Jesus Christ is part of the Godhead. But most people who must hear this are so indoctrinated that they are told, do not watch things like this. Anyone who says this to you is in control of you. If you are an adult, you should with your own free will watch whatever you want and make a decision to stay with what you believe or leave. So like a certain pastor said, no church has all the truth. But we should not be here advocating church and living parallel to each other because we have different doctrines. We cannot see eye to eye. We cannot even greet each other. Remember the Good Samaritan. Christ is calling us to start reading his word and obeying it, not any other. And stop putting yokes around people's necks when their salvation is free. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for enlightening us with your word. As we walk through it, may we find more and more grace and greater joy. Lift us from the burden of self-righteousness, as well as a feeling of being special. But may we see us in every light the same and treat them the same. May we preach the gospel knowing that only you will determine a person's salvation. Have your way in our lives, we pray. For we pray this prayer in no other name but the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and through the Father. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you have been blessed, feel free to like, to share, and subscribe if you have not yet done so. And as you do so, may you rest in the wise, objective, resourceful, and definitive word of God. Amen.